We are so pleased that Ms. Lowry is able to join us as part of the Robert H. Jackson Center's mission to further the world's understanding of the Holocaust, the crimes committed against humanity, and justice served to many criminals involved. Today we have the privilege of seeing original film of the Nazi troops taking over Denmark. Watch as celebration changes to fear. Look for German soldiers stealing from the Danes the mean ways these Nazis treated the people of Denmark, and the ways the Danish people spread the word of their resistance against this evil. Watch for the pride shown by King Christian and the citizens of Denmark. Look for the ways the Jewish people were hidden as they were transported to Sweden in the Danish fishing boats. These events were real, and Lois Lowry wrote about them in Number of the Stars. We take you back to 1940. Please hold your applause for Lois Lowry. Um, I'm here from Boston, and it's a pleasure to be with you and with a lot of other kids earlier this morning. I've got some pictures to show you that in some ways are very much like the film you just saw, but they will show you a little bit about how I came to write uh, this book and how some of the details found their way into it. And the first picture is of a person. This is my Danish friend. Annalisa is a very common name. I didn't use her name in the book. I called the child Anne-Marie, which would be pronounced Anna-Marie in Den Denmark. Annalisa grew up in Denmark, but she married an American, and so I met her when she lived in this country, and her husbands were law partners. Annalisa had a son with a Danish name, Torben. I'll just tell you a quick funny story about him. When he was a very little boy, he was very shy, and he was riding in a supermarket cart with his mom in a supermarket, and somebody looked at him, as they do to little kids, and said, aren't you cute? What's your name? And he was about two, and he said, Torben. And the person said, that's a strange name. What kind of name is Torben? And he said, it means God of Thunder. Uh, and it does, and I named it the book Number of the Stars. I gave the kitten Torben's name, the shortened form, God of Thunder for the kitten. Uh, her son, Torben, grew up with my son. Uh, they were the same age, and they were close friends from the time they were little boys. And their moms, Annalise and I, were very close friends. One time, she and I were talking about our childhoods, our early years, and we discovered that we had something sad in common, that we had both had older sisters who died young. So we had both lost older sisters. And I explained to her that my sister had died of cancer. And I said, what happened to your sister? And she said, my sister was newly married and she was expecting a baby, but we had very little food and no medical care and she and the baby both died when the baby were born, was, was born. And I said, what do you mean you had no food and no medical care? And she said, well, uh, we were occupied by the Nazis in those days. Now, I had gone to school, I had gone to college, I had studied history. I probably knew about the history of Denmark, but I had not remembered it. And so I asked Annalisa to tell me the story of her country. And when she did, I realized it would be a wonderful story to tell to kids in a way that they would remember it forever. And uh, so that was the origin of the book. The next picture is of a child, actually, and a book, two things that are very important to me, and this child particularly important because she's my own granddaughter. I'll talk more about her a little later on, but I just wanted you to get her implanted in your brain for a minute. Uh, so she's there on the back of your mind. But we'll go on now to Number the Stars. This, as you can see, is a map of Denmark. It's kind of complicated to look at, but if you look in the lower right-hand corner, you will see a square. You can see the swastika on the square, and that shows you Germany. Just above it, sticking out like a hand reaching up, is Denmark. Can you see that? And can you see that they have a little border there between them? Can you see also how huge Germany is compared to Denmark? Germany, of course, by this time, with their enormous army, had gone around devastating Europe. And now, in 1940, they move north across that little border and uh, move into Denmark. Denmark, and you know this from the book because I have the child's father tell her a little bit of the history, 
had practically no army, very small navy. It was a peaceful country of farmers and fishermen. And so the king of Denmark surrendered his country to the Nazis. Now, can you look over there across to the right of Denmark and you can see Sweden. Sweden is a large country. And you can see that Denmark, if you're still looking in that lower uh, corner, in the right-hand corner, you can see that Denmark is a country of islands. And you see Sweden there to its right. Now, if you look at the big map, move your eyes left, and you will see Copenhagen, right in the middle of the page to the right of where the book uh, opens. Uh, Copenhagen is right there on the border close to Sweden. And it's true that on the coast of, of Denmark there, you can look across, as the girls do in the book, and you can see Sweden. Uh, nowadays, a few years ago, there was a bridge uh, built. So nowadays, you can get into your car and you can drive across to Sweden. But in, in the 1940s, of course, uh, that was all open water. And uh, it was visible, but it was not easy to get to. And it was certainly not easy to get to when the country was occupied by the Nazis. So that's the setting of the book. This is a little history of Denmark. This is a painting back in the 19th century that shows a Jewish section of Denmark. Denmark uh, had always had Jewish citizens. And here's an amazing fact that I learned when I was doing the research. And this is not in the book, because I didn't find a place to put it into the story. But in the early part of the 1900s, around 19, uh, excuse me, 18, uh, did I say 1900s? I meant 1800s. Around 1825, the Danish parliament passed a law that said it was illegal to discriminate against anybody on the basis of their race or religion. Now, if you turn the pages of your history book back in your mind, back to that early 1800s, and picture what it was like in this country at that same time. At the same time that Denmark said, you may not discriminate against anybody, in this country, we were bringing Africans over in the holds of ships and using them as slaves. This shows you what a, the kind of country that Denmark was from its earliest history. And uh, here this painting shows Jewish people in Denmark going about their daily life. The people of Denmark loved King Christian. Uh, this picture seems to me to be taken at the same time as the film. And they said it was 1941 in the film, and I have it listed as 1940. But probably King Christian had a huge celebration on his birthday every year. So this could be either time. Uh, King Christian was greatly loved in that country. My friend Annalisa told me they always had a Christian or a Frederick as a king. Christian had a son, Frederick, who became king. Frederick would have a son named Christian who would become king. So they had Frederick Christian, Frederick Christian for many, many decades and generations. Uh, no longer true. I've forgotten. I think they have a queen now. Uh, so the Christian and Frederick thing has ended. But here's King Christian, who was their very greatly loved king. And my friend Annalisa told me about, and I did use this in the book, about how King Christian rode his horse out, not among crowds, this is his birthday celebration, but every day by himself, uh, out of his palace where he lived in the center of uh, Copenhagen, out through the streets. And if you were standing on the street, you could see King Christian, as my friend did, and wave to him, and he would wave back. They felt very closely connected to him. And so even after the Nazis took over the country, they allowed King Christian to remain in the palace, sort of under house arrest, but they did allow him to ride his horse out each day because that made the people feel as though everything was okay. And it was in the interest of the Nazis to, for the Danish people to be subdued. They had enough problems dealing with all the people they were fighting and destroying in the rest of Europe. They wanted to keep Denmark Quiet. And so they let the king take his daily ride. And this picture actually shows two Nazi soldiers saluting the king. I used uh, a little passage in the book to describe this. Uh, first of all, I used the story my, my friend Annalisa had told me, uh, but I had it happening to Anne Marie instead of Annalisa. She said her sister had taken her to stand on the sidewalk so that she could wave to King Christian. Sometimes he had waved back to the two of them and smiled. 
Now you are special forever, Lisa had told her once, because you have been greeted by a king. Later on, in the same chapter, I tell another story. And this did not happen, was not observed by my friend, but I read this in one of the books when I was doing research. And this is a true story. And so I made it happen in the book because it was such a wonderful story. I didn't want to leave it out. One evening, Papa had told her that earlier he was on an errand near his office, standing on the corner, waiting to cross the street, when King Christian came by on his morning ride. One of the German soldiers had turned suddenly and asked a question of a teenage boy nearby. Who is that man who rides past here every morning on his horse? The German soldier had asked. Papa said he had smiled to himself, amused that the German soldier did not know. He listened while the boy answered. He is our king, the boy told the soldier. He's the king of Denmark. Where is his bodyguard? The soldier had asked. And do you know what the boy said? Papa had asked Anne Marie. She was sitting on his lap. She was little then, only seven. She shook her head, waiting to hear the answer. The boy looked right at the soldier and he said, all of Denmark is his bodyguard. That was the way the people of Denmark felt about their king. And CD that I have with the music on it is from a rehearsal tape, so you just hear piano with it instead of a full orchestra. This particular song is the three little girls. Anne Marie and Ellen played uh, on, in New York by two, uh, I think, 11-year-old girls. And the little sister, Kirsty, who was played by a lovely little seven-year-old girl. I'll just tell you a funny little bit of trivia about that. A year later, it was performed again in New York. Then I went to see it again. And I was signing books afterward, and a little girl came up to me and grinned. And she said, do you remember me? And I wasn't sure. She said, I was Kirsty last year. And she had been so great the year before. I said, why aren't you in it this year? Although the second year the child was good, but this first child had been spectacular. And she said, I'm now in Les Mis. <laughs> Anyhow, so those three little girls are singing here, and it's now 1943. And, and it's the beginning of, of the book, when this, the little girls have been stopped on the street by German soldiers. You may remember when they're running down the street on their way home from school, and they've been questioned by the soldiers. And as they walk away, they say to each other, I was so scared. And the other child says, me too. And they say that in the song. But something else is in the song as well. They begin singing uh, about what it was like before the soldiers were there. And they talk in the song, sing in the song about Tivoli. And here in the book it says of Anne Marie, she loved Tivoli Gardens in the, hope, in the heart of Copenhagen. Her parents had taken her there often when she was a little girl. She remembered the music and the brightly colored lights, the carousel and ice cream, and especially the fireworks in the evening, the huge colored splashes and bursts of light in the evening sky. I remember the fireworks best of all, she commented to Ellen. Me too, Kirsty said. I remember the fireworks. You didn't. You never saw the fireworks, Anne-Marie scoffed. So you hear that in the song. You hear the little girl whose teeth were missing when she sang the song, so you can hear her lisping a little bit. Uh, I've forgotten what words she sings in which you, you hear that. Uh, but she talks about riding the carousel. Uh, and so they, they sing about Tivoli, and I, I want you to listen to that because I want to talk about Tivoli a little later. Uh, by 1943, the Germans have burned Tivoli Garden. If you, it's back uh, now, of course, and if you ever go to Copenhagen, and I hope you will, you must go there because it's one of the most magical places uh, in the world. But listen now to song one, Tech Guy, uh, to the little girl singing about uh, the three years that this country has been occupied.
They thought I was Danish. I felt very honored. So I said, yeah, I'm from Boston. Anyhow, uh, from Copenhagen, I took the, the train up to that village to, to look at all the places I was going to describe and, and to prepare to write the section of the book uh, where the people would be taken uh, by boat to safety. Now, most of the Jewish population of Copenhagen, of, of Denmark, excuse me, lived in that area around Copenhagen. Most of Denmark is populated by farmers and fishermen. They have that wonderful coast, uh, you're only seeing a little part of it here, and wonderful farmlands. No mountains and forests the way they had in Norway. Uh, but uh, the Jewish population were not generally farmers or fishermen, they were businessmen and teachers and doctors and lawyers, and they lived in the suburbs of Copenhagen. And so that's where all of that was taking place. Let's see what I have next here. Okay, this is a German, Georg, I haven't given you his first name there, Dukwitz, it's pronounced. Uh, he's a very ordinary looking man, but for me he's very special, he's dead now. Uh, he was a businessman who did a lot of business in Denmark, and a diplomat of sorts. And when the time came that from Hitler's headquarters, the, the Nazi leaders in Denmark got the order that they were now to round up the Jews, collect the Jews in Denmark, and they would all be brought to Germany to be put to death in the concentration camps. Uh, and in fact, I should go back to that map. Uh, a large ship had been brought into Copenhagen Harbor a uh, cargo vessel, and it was sitting out there waiting because the intention was to load that ship uh, with people, with Jewish people, and they were to be collected the end of October during the Jewish holidays when they would all be at home. They had the addresses of all of them, and, uh, and they had gotten them the lists of Jews from the synagogue, and uh, the ship was waiting, and it was going to be filled with people who would be taken to their death. Uh, and so all of that was happening, or about to happen, when this man, and who knows what went on in his mind, but he was one of those people who made the right decision at the right time. He, he thought, I, I assume, this is insane, what's happening. We can't continue to let this happen. And so, at the risk of his own life, he went to the Danish government and he told them, this is what Hitler has now planned, uh, and this is when it's going to happen. And so now the Danish government knew, and they had to act very quickly. They didn't have much time. And they, one thing that happened was, excuse me, I've forgotten this picture was here. This is not the rabbi who was in Copenhagen at the time. This is his son. Uh, the, the rabbi had five children and a wife, and they were all saved by going, uh, by being taken by boat to Sweden. Uh, and this is the son of that rabbi. But this is what I was looking for. On October 3rd, 1943, in every Christian church in Denmark, these are not Jewish synagogues now, a letter was read to all the people who came to church that Sunday, and it said this, wherever Jews are persecuted because of their religion or race, it is the duty of the Christian church to protest against such persecution because it is in conflict with the sense of justice inherent in the Danish people and inseparable from our Danish Christian culture. Our different religious views notwithstanding, we shall fight for the cause that our Jewish brothers and sisters may preserve the same freedom which we ourselves evaluate more highly than life itself. That was October 3rd. So now the Christian population knows and they go into action and they begin to hide their Jewish brothers and sisters, the term that he used. And that happened in many different ways, uh, and too many to tell you, and some were quite ingenious. A number of Jewish people were hidden in hospitals, disguised as patients. They were put into hospital beds, and false records were drawn up for them. And the Danes have a wonderful sense of humor, even in the worst of times, and so those hospital records when it came place to write in a diagnosis, they put German measles. And so they moved people with German measles, Jewish people, by ambulance to the coast. That was only one of many, many secret ways in which they, they got the people to safety. When the time came, at the end of the month, 
the Jewish holidays when, in fact, the order was given and the SS troops, the worst of the Nazis, went to every address they had, every house, every apartment. I want to bang on this, but I'm afraid I'll break my computer. No, that's not a good enough bang. Picture a loud banging uh, and banged on the doors of those houses and apartments. Uh, all of them were empty. Nobody was there. And everybody had been taken in and hidden uh, in the homes and barns and warehouses of the Christian population. This is one of the actual boats with which they moved them to safety. Many, many crossings uh, of that water with the Nazis looking everywhere and madder and madder and more and more frustrated because they couldn't find the Jews. Uh, this shows you what a small boat it is. And in the next picture is one of the actual fishermen who, who made that difficult and dangerous journey at the risk of his own life. This shows him as a man in his 70s. Uh, when he was a young fisherman in 1943, he, of course, was very, I, I just said, young, a much younger man, but he probably had that same look on his face. It's a typical Danish look, that smile. Uh, it gives a sense of compassion and comfort and disregard of his own safety as he sets out to, to save other people. And while his face, Svensson, Fredrik Svensson, uh, while his face is up here so that you can see him, uh, I will play you, I will have my guy, uh, play you a second song, but I'll explain first that in the book, because of the way the plot took place, uh, the, the uncle takes the Rosen family to Sweden in the early morning. Uh, in the song for the stage, they have the fishermen singing. And I remember on the stage, it was quite a bare stage, and there was a large coiled rope, the kind of rope you see on boats. And he was wearing a cap just like this, a Danish fisherman's cap, sitting on the rope alone. And he sang this song, but he's singing about taking them at night. And certainly, they made such crossings, both in day and night. OK, song two. but you need me now. And that reminds me of another true story that I heard about a Jewish man who got a phone call while he was at work. One of the phone calls that so many got, alerting them to the fact that they must, must hide now, uh, telling him that he must hide his, uh, his, go into hiding with his wife and children. And he took the train to work every day from outside of the city. And he was so 
distraught after getting this phone call. He left work, got back on the train to go home to figure out what to do, uh, to figure out how to hide with his wife and children. And when he was returning to his home by train, the conductor came through to get his ticket, the same conductor that was on the train every day. And the conductor recognized him and said, why are, why are you leaving work? Are you ill? And he said, no, but I'm very upset. I, I don't know what to do. And he explained to the conductor what was happening and that he had been told to go into hiding. And he was frightened. He didn't know what to do. And the conductor said, come to my house. I'll hide you and your family. And he said to the train conductor, we don't even know each other. I don't even know your name. And the conductor held out his hand and said, I'm Peter Olson. Now you do. And he took him and his family. And it was the way all of the Danes uh, acted and behaved during that time. It's kind of a wonderful example. Uh, this is a rabbi who, in fact, was one of the few Danish Jews who did not escape. Out of the 7,000, there were 500 who did not escape. Of those, only 50 died. But he was one of the 500 who, who ended up in a concentration camp. Another who did not make it back and who did not survive was a woman who said when told she should hide uh, and, and flee and make her way to Sweden, she said, they wouldn't want me. I'm 95 years old, Jewish woman. And she was wrong. And she was one of the ones who was rounded up and placed in that ship and taken to Germany. And of course, did not survive. But here's a rabbi who the war has now ended. He's back in his country. And this is an actual photograph of him performing the first service after his release. And now I'm going to have them play. Uh, but before he does, I'm, I'll just explain to you. People have often asked me the origin of the title, Number of the Stars. And it does come from the Bible, from the psalm that I used in the book, and the many references to stars, including the Star of David necklace. And uh, here, the writer of the show has used the actual words of the Bible for this song. Blessed is the Lord our God. He watches over me. He watches over me. How good it is to sing praises to the Lord. It is he who heals the broken in spirit, he who binds in the wounds. He watches over me, he watches over me. It is he who numbers the applauded. Good for you guys for, to recognize how important that is. This is a young man who was one of the resistance leaders in Denmark. They were mostly young. And in the film clip that you saw earlier, you saw some of them being released from prison. And the narrator said some of them had been in prison for four years. Actually, a lot of them were not in prison more than a few days before they were executed. And this is one. Uh, when I went to Copenhagen and, and spent time at the Resistance Museum there, one of the things I looked at very carefully was the pictures of these young people who, who were so brave and in so much danger and in many cases lost their lives. And this one struck me in particular. The young man on the left was a resistance fighter who was killed, executed. 
And I think the reason it struck me was for some reason he, he reminded me so much of my own son who was the same age. More about that in a minute. But remember the face of this young man on the left. His name was Kim. We think of that as a girl's name here, but it's a very common boy's name in Denmark. The night before he was executed, and here is where he was executed, tied to a pole in, in Copenhagen uh, and shot. The young people who were shot here were buried here. Their families were not allowed to have their bodies. And uh, the graves were marked with numbers. After the war, uh, they were disinterred and their families were allowed to rebury their bodies. But here he is where he was shot. And the night before he was to die, and he knew he was to die the next day, they allowed him to write a letter to his mother. And I'll just read you part of what this says. I know that you are a courageous woman and that you will bear this, but hear me, it is not enough to bear it, you must also understand it. I am an insignificant thing, and my person will soon be forgotten, but the thought, the life, the inspiration that filled me, <coughs> excuse me, will live on. The fact is, I'll stop quoting his letter there, but he says his person will not be forgotten, will soon be forgotten, but the fact is that as long as we continue to tell this story, he will not be forgotten, and what he stood for will not be forgotten. And that's one of the reasons why it's so important to retell and retell the stories of these times and what happened. This is the little girl who appears on the cover of the book. This is some years before the book was written. She was a Swedish child. Her father was a Swedish consul in the United States. I was a photographer at the time. They had hired me to photograph her. She had grown up, but I had kept the photograph and I got her permission to use it on the cover of the book. She now has four children of her own. And she's a very beautiful woman, as you can guess. Uh, here she is on the cover. Uh, it's my photograph, but the publisher used the necklace which appears in the book uh, and I just want to say a word about the necklace of course its symbolism also is the star and number of the stars there is a place in the book that you're familiar with where the child pulls the necklace from her friend's neck and hides it in her hand as they're interrogated by the Nazi soldiers a teacher in Tennessee wrote me that she was reading the book aloud to her fourth graders and on the last day, she had bought herself a necklace like this. She herself was not Jewish, but she found a necklace with the Star of David, and she wore it for the reading of the final chapter of the book. And she said, of course, the children noticed it right away. So she took it off, and she gave it to one child. <clears throat> In the book, when the soldiers leave, the little girl opens her hand and discovers that she's imprinted the Star of David on the palm of her hand. The teacher told me that as she read the last chapter, she looked at her class, 22 children, and she said she watched as they passed the necklace around, and each of them imprinted the Star of David into their own hand. That was probably 10 years ago she told me that story. So those children are now 20, perhaps. I would like to think, and she would like to think, that there are 20 children, 22 children, who Whatever happens in their life, however angry and destructive they might feel as they get older and life doesn't turn out the way they hoped, those children are never going to go spray paint swastikas on a synagogue or overturn gravestones in a Jewish cemetery because they imprinted something uh, as a result of learning about the story of Denmark. Here it is in Turkish and Hungarian, Japanese, Portuguese, Dutch, Spanish, I may be getting some of those languages wrong, uh, but the book is all over the world now, and children all over the world read it. And that means a great deal to me, not because I wrote the book, but because of what the book has to say to children all over the world about the fact that, that children can maintain integrity and make a difference in this very difficult world. This is a little boy in Connecticut who was about to be bar mitzvahed at age 12 and decided that as a result of reading this book, instead of having a party and a disc jockey, uh, he wanted to go to Denmark. And so he was bar mitzvahed in Denmark at the synagogue there and he with his family followed the route of the Jews as they made their way to safety along the coast. 
And this is a child in an ESL class in Washington, D.C., who has related the book to her own life. She said, when I read this story, I mean, it reminded me of when my family escaped from Vietnam. I wasn't born yet, but my father has told me about it. My older sister passed away, almost like Lisa. She wasn't executed, but she drowned. People escaped Vietnam on boats. All the children had to go first. An airplane shot at the boat my older sister was on. Everyone on the boat drowned. So it's another example of how people whatever form their life's difficulties have taken, can all relate to the, the story of, of danger and, and uh, persecution and, and moving from place to place. Uh, this is my son, the one that I showed you the picture of in relation to the, the Kim, the resistance fighter. This is the same son when he was your age, 12 years old. We lived in Maine on a farm and he had his own horse. And I shouldn't tell you this, but because I told the last group of kids this, I will tell you that his sisters always look at this photograph and say, two horses' asses side by side. Uh, he was not a horse's ass, but it, it, uh, it does lend oneself to, lend itself to uh, that remark. Sorry about that. Uh, <laughs> all right. Okay. Uh, this is uh, when he graduated from college. And he uh, wanted very much to fly, and so he entered the Air Force and became a pilot in the Air Force. And he was stationed in Germany. You can see him there in his flight suit and with his very fancy car. Boys always like that car. Girls go ho-hum. Uh, but when he went to buy a fancy German car, he met the beautiful manager of the car agency and she took him for a test drive and he got the car and got the girl. And we went to Germany for their wedding. Uh, their wedding, you can see a plane at the top of that wedding cake with a bride and groom in it. He was a, a F-15 uh, pilot, a fighter pilot. Um, the wedding was in Germany in an ancient church. It was a Catholic ceremony, all in German, except for one part of it. One brief moment in the ceremony, a woman in the back of the church and with a beautiful voice stood and sang a song with words from the Bible. And it said, your people will be my people. Where you go, I will go. It was very moving, particularly when I looked around across the aisle as the German family her father, who was too young to fight in the German army, but her grandfather was killed on the Russian front, looked around at my family, my son's stepfather, who was Jewish, who was in the army at the end of World War II, uh, all of these different people from different places and different faiths and different walks of life, and someone there singing, your people will be my people. And I thought, we are all each other's people, and we have to learn to remember that. Uh, here they are five years later, and you can't tell, but <clears throat> in the bottom of that picture, down toward one of those white polka dots, is their little girl who is still uh, unborn, but Margaret is now pregnant with their daughter. And here is their daughter, who was for a long time called Bean because she looked like a lima bean in an ultrasound picture. Uh, there she is in Germany, close to two years old. And when the spring that she was getting on toward two years old, about the time this picture was taken, my son called me one day in Boston, where I live, from Germany, just to tell me this, that that morning she had stood up in her crib with a big grin and sung to him, I love you, you love me, we're a happy family singing in English because she was learning both languages at once and she probably had songs she could sing in German as well by then. But two weeks after this photograph was taken, my daughter-in-law called me from Germany early in the morning to tell me that my son had been killed. So my little granddaughter was left without a father. And from that time, you know what, I forgot to tell you something very important, and so I'm going to go back to that. Uh, and I'm going to go back photographically just to get there. And that was that at this wonderful wedding, there was one person who was not there. 
and that was my friend Annalisa, who was living now in Denmark, just above the border there with Germany. And I called her, because she'd known my son throughout his early years, to invite her to the wedding. And when I did that, there was a long silence, and then she said, I can't come. She said, it's not that I can't come, she said, but I won't come. She said, I never want to set foot in Germany. I hate Germany. I hate Germans. I don't want to meet your daughter-in-law. So I was very much aware of her absence at that wedding and, and, at that, and my sadness at that long period of hatred uh, that she continued to feel. And so I, I'm sorry that I forgot to tell you that, but now time has passed, five years have passed, and now two years have passed after that. It's seven years later, my son has been killed, and now there's a funeral in Germany, and I don't even call her because I know she won't set foot in that country. My son is buried in the little German village where he lived and where his wife and daughter still live. Following his death, my little granddaughter began to ask me whenever I visited to tell her stories about her papa. Papa is what a European child calls daddy. And so I always did my best to dredge up the old stories. She loved the ones where he was naughty, particularly the one where he threw a snowball at a car and it turned out to be a police car. Uh, so always there was the endless refrain of, tell me more stories about my papa. And I did make a little book for her using photographs of her with her father when she was little, during that brief time they had together. And I did a little rhyming text. This was not a published book. It said things like, using the photograph, he showed me where flowers bloomed down by the path. When we got home, Papa gave me my bath. Uh, he rubbed me and scrubbed me until I was clean. I called him Papa, and he called me Bean. Now it's Mama who holds me and cuddles me near. We watched it every night for the stars to appear. Uh, we love to remember when Papa was here. Here the stars reference in that again. Stars are an important symbol in many ways. Anyway, now she's four years old. I'm there again. I'm visiting. She's saying again, tell me new stories, more stories about Papa. And I said, pack your bags to my daughter-in-law and granddaughter. I said, I'm going to take you on a trip. And I took them to Copenhagen. We stayed in that same hotel behind where the Germans marched in. And it's right next door to Tivoli. We spent a day in Tivoli. My little granddaughter did everything the children in the song sang about. We rode the carousel. Uh, she had the blue horse. I had the white. Uh, and then they rang a little bell. We watched a puppet show. We listened to music. And then uh, we had dinner in Tivoli. And I had called her and commanded her to come. My friend Annalisa came. And so when she arrived, I said to my granddaughter, here's somebody who can tell you the stories about your papa. And so I could see my friend, who had told me I hate all Germans, I could see her discomfort and her stiffness. And then as I watched, and she began to tell the stories that she knew, uh, as I watched, she took the German child onto her lap and gave her a hug. And I, I was reminded, as I'd like to remind all of you, that Children are the ones who make a difference in this world and who change things. So I'm going to end with one final song and a picture of this grandchild who is now 12 and in sixth grade in Germany, your age. So song number four. Thank you.
Thank you all. special effort here to hear an extra special presentation by Lois Lowry. I have one final question and then we will uh, depart. Uh, as I recall, Jefferson will be leaving second, just so you know, so stay in your seats for a little bit. We, have, we had lots of questions, but boiling it down for the benefit of the students, here you wrote this book which has been published in many, many nations, many languages, What's the legacy of Number of the Stars? Well, legacy means what continues for a long time, and we don't know that. We can only hope. But I certainly hope that by telling and retelling and reminding each other of a story about human integrity and people caring for one another, whatever their differences, racial, religious, uh, that the world can be made a better place. And all of you will play a role in that. I wish you well. To Lois Lowry, we say thank you. Thank you.